Hello, everyone. Welcome to part 37 of our series on uh, what is a library if the building is closed. Uh, now, as libraries in recovery, we hope, we presume, we strive for. Today's uh, session is about community networks. Do they work? We'll hear about that very soon. Uh, we started these, as most of you will know, uh, in March, right after the pandemic was declared, when this question about, you know, how, what are we, what's going on? How we respond? Uh, how do we react? Uh, and that question about now, okay, what, what is a library or, or any institution, as far as that goes, that's a, a public space, what does it mean if the, if the facility itself is unavailable? And that uh, set up a number of really interesting questions and certain aspects of that question, like internet access and, and digital services, physical materials, and uh, social infrastructure, which is a very important role for libraries, uh, increasingly so. And it has just rolled on from there with, uh, we've had over uh, 4,000 registrations for the series and some 90 speakers uh, holding forth on really interesting uh, stuff. So uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, my name is Don Means. We're producing this series in a partnership with uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions with Steven Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA at the controls in the Netherlands. Uh, our, our session sponsor is the uh, DC chapter of the Internet Society. I hope uh, Dustin is on somewhere. We're going to ask him to uh, say something for us. And our series sponsor uh, this quarter is Adaptrum, a technology company building radios in the, in the TV bands <clears throat> that has been a supplier on a number of projects that we're involved in. So. Uh, these are our two speakers. We're so uh, happy to have Chris Mitchell and, and Dr. Belur with us uh, to talk about community networks. They're both extremely accomplished in this area, and it's one of the one of the important uh, approaches to uh, this universal uh, access, or at least public access. We've talked about this in terms of a, a, a three part approach of hubs, community hubs like libraries where people can go, uh, community networks, which is a growing uh, phenomenon that we'll hear more about where people who are living in places that are unserved or underserved uh, have decided not to just wait for the cavalry to come, which it looks like it will never come because it hasn't already come. And that's because of the, the market assessment uh, for, these, uh, for these communities is unprofitable. And yet that is just unacceptable to a lot of people for obvious reasons. So we'll get into that in a moment. Um, first, we're going to return to our COVID report. That's what really generated this whole uh, series in the first place was the pandemic. And uh, this is the latest data, which is just stunning. This graph is just remarkable. I mean, we were, we were kind of panicky there in the spring when the cases were hitting 60,000 a day. Uh, I'm sorry, in the summer when they were crossing 60,000 a day, we were kind of freaking out. It trailed off a bit and then it just hockey sticked up for the uh, end of the year and peaking, uh, I think on January 6th or something like that at right at 300,000 cases. So a shocking number of people have succumbed. The US still leads the world in its exceptionalism around this with roughly 20 to 25% of cases and, and deaths, but happily we're on the way down. Uh, it's just phenomenal uh, change of direction. No one is really explaining this other than, well, people are trying to finally getting the message and you know, putting masks on. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, extraordinary news of vaccines. I mean, it hasn't been a full year since the pandemic was declared and there are effective vaccines out there. The, the issue, of course, that the variants maybe alter that, uh, that story a bit and we just don't yet know how, how much. But the fact that they do exist, I mean, there's still no vaccine for, for HIV. And that's typical with these viruses. It's just really an extraordinary accomplishment in the face of this threat, which of course we are contributing to. Uh, but not to get too 
uh, comfortable here uh, from Larry Brilliant, uh, uh, world-renowned epidemiologist uh, that makes this point that no, we're not safe until everybody's safe because the reason of these variants is that that's what viruses do. They, they mutate uh, in response to their environment. They're trying to survive like every other organism. And so they change. Uh, and, and as they do, they're spawning these variants. And as long as they're out there in large numbers, then that's what they will do. And so this is the point I think here that nobody, uh, uh, Larry was um, one of the, uh, uh, the, the team that actually eradicated smallpox, tracked down and, and, uh, and, and stopped it finally after all those uh, centuries. And he's, uh, he's a guy to uh, watch and listen to. Uh, of course, this is not our only disaster. We've we've touched on this. We've got we've got serious uh, extreme weather events driven by climate change uh, out here in California. This is our flavor, uh, but you know, the middle of the country, just forty percent of the corn crop in Iowa was flattened in an afternoon because of this uh, enormous winds. We had a hurricane season that you know was just completely unprecedented, and here we had an event where two of them landed at the same time, virtually at the same time. I mean that's never happened. So the point of that all is we are in a different environment, and it may make the pandemic look like a picnic before this thing is over. Uh, here's a new player on the on the scene of of uh, weather disasters: extreme cold, prolonged cold. Uh, Texas is frozen, and uh, there are a lot of infrastructure lessons we might get into at some point, but not today. Uh, we wish the Texans uh, luck in thawing out and recovering. <laughs> um, we're going to open uh, with a short presentation on uh, this comment that Gigabit Libraries has filed in response to the, uh, the petition seeking relief from uh, the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC that restricts the anchor institutions under E-rate, libraries and schools, from extending uh, connectivity beyond the, uh, the property and the building. And uh, with us to talk about that, that filing is uh, Stephen Augustino from Kelly Dry, uh, a leading uh, DC law firm that, that is extremely knowledgeable and specialized in this and helps us prepare this this uh, filing. So, Steve, welcome. Can you tell us kind of, I mean, we wrote this, but, you know, can you kind of tell us uh, the background and what this particular filing may mean and, and where you think it's going to go? Sure thing, Don. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, you know, for the benefit of those, and it's my first time on this, so for the benefit of everybody, um, I am, an, as Don said, an attorney at Kelly Dry and Warren in Washington, D.C. We do a lot of things, including um, federal universal service fund work. Um, so I have put in the chat um, two documents for you, links to um, some relevant information. I'll also, after I finish my presentation, put my own contact information in there in case you want to follow up with me as well. Um, but I'm assuming everybody knows about the E-rate program, long-standing program, very successful program, providing funding for schools and libraries for broadband services. As a result of the COVID pandemic, the FCC issued a number of waivers of its rules over the past year or so, dealing with filing deadlines, filing windows, um, exemptions to the gift rules um, and, and other things to allow schools and libraries to proceed as much as possible um, on a normal process in a very abnormal um, environment here. Um, there also in the last uh, month has been a change in the administration and the, the uh, leadership at the FCC came with the change in the, in the presidency the new acting chairwoman is a champion of E-rate. She was involved in the original passage of the rules, um, of the statute rather, and uh, has been very active while at the FCC on this. So people are expecting a much more open um, 
commission looking at uh, e-rate issues and the, the broadband issues. In particular, one of her main issues has been the so-called homework gap that is the problem of students not having access to internet at home to do things like uh, homework and research, et cetera, when they have it at the school itself. Um, the, the several parties have come forward and asked the FCC to adopt interim waivers relating to this homework gap problem or relating more specifically to providing remote learning um, services for students. And um, Shelby, a, a organization of schools and healthcare and library um, entities, filed one of the petitions. Uh, the um, New Mexico um, Board of Education filed another one, and Colorado School Interest filed a third. So the FCC has asked for comment on this on an expedited basis. Uh, with the expectation that they will grant a, um, a, a some kind of a waiver um, to allow broadband um, funding for broadband uses um, in, in remote learning. Uh, on behalf of the Gigabit Libraries Network, we pro provided comments and I put a link into the comments um, in the chat as well on this. Uh, we were one of about 110 parties that filed comments on this. Um, the request received quite a lot of support um, and uh, some discussions at the margin about um, how to make changes to it, which I can talk about if we have time. Um, the main thing for us at, in our filing and for Gigabit Libraries Network was to um, provide a background and justification for the commission to continue to treat schools and libraries the same under this program. Um, and so we talked about the ways in which libraries are also contributing to remote learning and providing remote access opportunities for um, students and for the community in this time frame. Um, the three major recommendations that we had um, are, are on the screen here as, as Don has them. So we supported the waivers, we supported allowing um, in, the uh, use of off-campus uses of broadband in the circumstances. Um, we talked about ways in which schools and libraries collaborate together or can collaborate together to provide a very effective um, learning environment for the uh, for K through 12 students as well as for the public at large. We asked that the commission explicitly allow public libraries to extend their access beyond the physical building using Wi-Fi hotspots, mobile um, kiosks, uh, bookmobiles, et cetera. And then we reminded the commission that uh, 10 years ago, they had set forth, 11 years ago now, they had set forth a um, goal of having a, a gigabit of internet into every library. So fiber to the library was the, the goal there. And that um, goal has, not been accomplished. It is um, an incomplete uh, access to it. So those were the comments on it. I, I will say that in terms of timing on this, I expect the commission will allow um, immediate um, use or funding to cover remote uses. Um, it will take them a little bit of time to get the rule out there, but it's likely to be a waiver. It may go into effect, you know, within the next three to six weeks, um, depending upon the, the overall, uh, how quickly the commission can act on this. Uh, but it does appear that there will be something that is granted here. Um, and we are hopeful that uh, it will recognize libraries and allow for a broad role for libraries as well. And I'll pause there, Don, and let you just ask if people have questions or want other information. That's great, Steve. And uh, and thank you for the support on this. It's uh, it's not the most uh, straightforward process to file comments or anything else. Uh, it's not terribly complicated, but there are definitely some some uh, procedures and strategies for expressing your ideas uh, on uh, these notices. Uh, but they are open. So I have a question for you, Steve. Uh, do these get read? 
what's you know how, what's the real process behind how these are treated by the SEC? You're being recorded, of course, so speak carefully. So every single word of every docket is read thoroughly, <laughs> very thoroughly. <laughs> I, you okay. know, look, look, this is an expedited proceeding. Um, there were, like I said, 110 comments, reply comments are due on Tuesday. Um, so it, it's hard for interested parties to make sure they read everything that's out there. Um, there is a team of staff that will read everything and that digests it and makes recommendations uh, to the commission. Uh, this will either require the bureau chief to grant the waiver and probably more likely it's going to require all five of the commissioners to consider an order um, and to uh, to vote on that. So there are many other people that can be you know, met with. Um, they will not read the entire record, but they will have summaries and, and things available, and they do take meetings on it. So how quickly they act on this is a is a question, and I see some um, you know some traffic in the chat on that. I'll try to respond to some of the stuff if I can after I finish speaking. Yeah, how about, uh, how about uh, Bob Boker's comment there that the FCC may wait for uh, action on the Shelby uh, petition pending the, the new E-rate legislation? Um, it, it's, po it's certainly possible. I mean, there's, you know, there's an emergency broadband benefit, which the commission is also working on, and they have to figure out how to make that consistent with this. Um, and then this draft legislation is talking about as much as up to $7.6 billion in additional funding for um, E-rate uses. So um, yeah, I think there's a concern about not making the funding duplicative and that might cause them to, right. to see how other things shake out. Right. Um, uh, Seth, thank you. Uh, Seth's asking if the waiver applies to libraries. That's the point here that we're trying to make to be explicit uh, about that. Usually these uh, rulings are expressed under E-rate, you know, schools and libraries. And libraries kind of treated as a su suffix to schools. Uh, and that has led to a number of sort of ambiguities in the, in the regulations is what applies or doesn't apply to a library that does to a school. And, and so what you'll read if you actually go to this is you'll see we're, we're calling for that to be explicitly pointed out and made clear to everyone among these other things. And to, to Steve's point, we have a window of replies to these comments and we would invite you to reply. Uh, uh, I think that link was in the chat. Uh, I don't know if, the, if that link is active on your screen now that we've got at the bottom of the slide. It shows it's active on mine, but I don't know. I'll put it in the chat anyway. So we, uh, whoops, we encourage everyone to, uh, to check in on that and, and weigh in on that. And, and you have until Tuesday to do that. So uh, thank you, Steve. It's been great. Yeah, last, Josh, last word. You know, one, just one quick clarification. Letters will be accepted in the docket even past Tuesday. So OK, good point. Good point. All right. That's so helpful. Great. OK, well, uh, before we get to our uh, our uh, guest speakers, uh, we wanted to give uh, our sponsor, the Internet Society, or rather the Washington DC chapter of the Internet Society, a chance to say hello. We wanted to thank them for their, for their support and for all their great work. Um, we have uh, Dustin Loop on. Uh, Dustin, are you there? Hey, yeah. I am. The, All right. Good. I'm Great. Here. Welcome, Dustin. Uh, the Internet Society, uh, if people may not know, is uh, one of the leading champions for community networking uh, solutions around, uh, well, the whole world. So, Dustin, uh, thanks for the support and, and tell us something about what you're doing there in D.C. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Don, for this opportunity. Um, you know, we're thrilled to be able to sponsor the great work that you're doing with these ongoing calls and uh, glad to see it still going strong after all this time. Um, and so just to take a step back, the Internet Society is a global organization and it has chapters all over the world that uh, carry out work in line with this shared vision that uh, we want a strong 
internet. So we promote things like security and trustworthiness, um, but we also want to grow the internet. And that's where a lot of this work comes into play, uh, making sure that the internet is extended to ideally everybody, right? And so um, our abilities to support this series and some of our work was made possible by a grant from the Internet Society Foundation, um, which provides a lot of funding for connectivity and other related initiatives. Um, and the grant that we got was had two objectives in mind. The first was to work with the Gigabit Libraries Network and the Georgia Public Library Service to expand uh, existing library infrastructure to provide uh, Wi-Fi access via these um, neighborhood library access stations or kiosks and uh, in doing so better serve the community's connectivity needs. Um, so in a in, a, in addition to extending access through this, this project, um, it'll also serve as a pilot and hopefully produce a case study that can provide a framework for other libraries, uh, both in Georgia and elsewhere. Um, so through, through this partnership with Gigabit Libraries Network and the Georgia Public Library Service, we are connected with a library in Vidalia, Georgia, um, to roll out a TV white space solution in their community. Um, due to some scheduled renovations at their building, it's, it's actually going to be deployed in a, a nearby town, um, but will be equally as impactful, if not greater. Um, and so um, we're, we're looking forward to watching this roll out. And uh, through the grant, we were able to uh, fund the um, equipment, and the installation fees, which I'll touch a little bit on in just a second. Um, but um, the, the other objective that I mentioned is to use this pilot project um, in addition to the DC chapters work in establishing a community network in Baltimore, as well as similar work from other chapters to uh, start to form a network focused on supporting community-driven connectivity efforts. Um, and uh, right now we're just in the process of, of forming a hub of sorts that can share resources, opportunities, uh, develop case studies, things like that, um, as well as convening events, webinars, maybe putting on uh, briefings for policymakers um, and mobilizing around different uh, calls to action, such as like the public comment opportunities that were uh, just discussed as well as other things like that. Um, Initially, it'll be focused in the North American region and um, uh, and with an emphasis on community driven efforts. So things through community networks, libraries, community centers, similar organizations like that. Um, but it's really open to anybody and ideally would grow through the network that we have at the Internet Society to have a larger footprint, but wanted to start with it being a little bit more focused and just to kind of share an example of why this is important to us um, in this project that we're doing in Georgia we're actually we have the equipment we have the location we have the funding um, but we're having a little bit and and they're having a little bit of trouble finding somebody that can actually um, install the equipment for them and provide that service. And so having a network that we could tap into to say like, hey, does anybody know somebody in Georgia that could help install this equipment? We have funding for it. We have everything that we need. We just need somebody to actually do it that's in that region. And so the opportunity to tap into those kinds of networks is an additional example of um, what we're hoping to do with that. So, um, that, that's really all I wanted to say. That's I wanted great, to... Dustin. No, really, I, I appreciate that. I know the, these projects are always a challenge. Uh, I would nominate uh, the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center for uh, exactly that kind of talent to set that up. And uh, Joe Hill is there. He's, he's been a partner with us on projects, and they've got a, a national network of 2,000 engineers, volunteers that are able to go in. They mostly focus on disaster, but they help uh, anchor institutions uh, all over the place. So we'll hook up with them and see if we can get them on the case. Thank you again for the, for the sponsorship and appearing today, and uh, we'll look forward to doing more uh, as we go along in this. So 
let's get to our, our main event here. Uh, and we're going to ask Chris Mitchell uh, of ILSR uh, to lead off and uh, talk about his work and community networking. And, and, and first, tell us, Chris, what does self-reliance mean? I mean, I think everybody understands the term, but in this context, you know, could you kind of anchor us in that? Sure, Don. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I really appreciate your work. I'm uh, a fan of libraries. One of our founders, um, I don't know, 47 years ago, David Morris, is a huge supporter of the library system. Um, we believe that libraries are just an, an incredibly important part of open society. Um, you know, Self-reliance to me um, is actually juxtaposed with um, self-sufficiency in that um, they're quite different. <laughs> um, self-sufficiency is sort of this idea of doing everything yourself. Self-reliance is more about recognizing where you can do things yourself. And, and I think, you know, in the situation, for instance, in Texas, it would be um, having systems that are more resilient and um, better able to um, break down gracefully. Um, to some extent within a community, it means being cognizant of where your resources are going. Um, you know, rather than being dependent on multinational corporations, being more focused on local jobs, uh, local businesses, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so, I mean, this is something that gets deep into the details. Um, I run the Community Broadband Networks program. Deeply appreciate your promotion to President Don, um, but I'm actually not in charge of the Institute. I've just run a program within it. Um, so um, I wanted to, I also wanted to say, I really, I'm, I'm glad that Internet Society is here. Internet Society recently sponsored a paper that uh, work that we did um, in which we detailed um, case studies of tribal networks that are community networks. Um, and uh, we compiled a list of all of the known tribal networks in the US. Um, and we recently um, made that um, public. Uh, we're doing more work on, on tribal community networks um, as well. Um, and I also want to say I'm excited to hear um, Sarbani after this. I've run into APC a few times. I really respect the work, the work that they do around the world. Uh, most of my experience with community networks is quite limited to the United States and has limited, um, you know, it has to be carefully um, shared elsewhere just because we have different customs and laws um, that give more flexibility to localities than many parts of the world do. Um, so I wanted to actually have something here and I'll throw in the chat room, a link that I encourage people to check out later if they find this interesting. But uh, as we think about why community networks and um, one of the things I wanted to respond to Don is that yes, absolutely community networks work. Now we just have to define what work means <laughs> because um, they, they're tasked with different things. Different communities might um, have much different goals as to what they get from them. But I think it's worth thinking about this in, in a sort of thought experiment, which is that we have a tremendous problem with homelessness in many parts of the United States. Nobody goes to home builders and says, hey, why aren't you building homes for these homeless people, right? And yet we have problems with internet access and people go to Comcast and AT&T and say, hey, how come you haven't solved this problem, right? We think of it as an internet access problem and it's not. It's a problem that has deeper social roots, is deeply connected to poverty. Um, and the mere fact that some companies have networks that are in these areas actually does not necessarily make them well suited to solve these problems. Um, and I would argue that institutions like libraries are actually much better suited um, in the longer term to make sure that people are having the kind of access that they need. So I try to get into that in this longer article that I just put a link to. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I think this is an audience that may appreciate um, if we move away from sort of thinking about infrastructure of community networks for a second. Um, People like the National Digital Inclusion Alliance have done really great work in noting that solving broadband um, means not just providing infrastructure, but actually training. And it has to be training that comes from people that are trusted in the community. We've just seen a really fantastic experiment um, Alabama used its CARES Act money to do a massive program with, um, with subsidies to provide internet access to families across Alabama. And I think it is broadly considered to have been not a success. And I don't know that I would call it a failure, but people are very frustrated at the level of uptake. And I think one way to think about this, and I, I think Alabama in working with CTC, Joanne Hovis, who cared a lot about trying to make this program work, they've learned lessons. But if we were to just imagine for a second, 
what would your reaction be upon getting a flyer in the mail about getting free internet access? I think you'd probably throw it away like I would. <laughs> um, and, and, and many people um, are not just going to learn about these programs um, so easily. They need to hear about it from a trusted source, which I think means libraries and school systems. And so as we see evidence coming out about how Alabama did with the first significant large scale effort to get um, subsidies out to take advantage of existing networks, I think one of the lessons is that we really need libraries and school districts to be much more involved in, in these programs to have them be successful. So with the little bit with the time I have left, I really want to make sure we have time for Q&A. So I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly. And if people want more information, we can talk about it. And I'm going to also follow up later offline. Um, right now, we're seeing several cities building what some call gap networks and some I think of as a life raft network which is often a free network, often using wireless technologies to try to bring some level of access to people who currently do not subscribe, uh, but may already have a device or there might be another program to help take care of that. Um, Tucson is actually doing this and we just wrote about it on our site, muninetworks.org. Um, and what's interesting to me is actually the incumbent providers are fighting very hard against this. Tucson is not trying to take over any of their market share. It is not threatening them in any way. It is trying to provide a free service to kids and seniors that do not have it. And they are reacting as though Bernie Sanders has come to town and attempted to nationalize the entire city, um, private industry. Um, and I, I find that dismaying. Um, I worry that we're gonna see more of those kinds of reactions to some of this. So I wanted to put that out there as a warning. Um, but we are seeing cities like San Antonio, Tucson, a lot of school districts using a system called CBRS. And I wanted to note why I think that's important, why they're using this technology. Um, without getting too deep into it, CBRS is a relatively new approach that offers a lot of interesting flexibility. One of the chief benefits is that if you want to deliver a high quality connection to people's homes, for instance, using Wi-Fi technology, you're going to have trouble putting transmitters in the streets that will penetrate into the home and deliver a high quality signal, which means if you really want to get a high quality signal, you would have to send someone to every home to put a receiver or transmitter uh, on that home or premise. Um, that's actually more feasible in larger apartment buildings and things like that. But as you're dealing with single family homes, it's very challenging and labor intensive. CBRS offers an opportunity to not have to do that because it, it allows you to send out a signal. And from the way that we looked at it in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, as we've been experimenting and just doing as estimates of what it would cost to do this, you put it on a four or five story building, for instance, it's sort of above the tree canopy, and you can offer a signal for perhaps five or six blocks, roughly half a mile, pretty strong signal to hundreds of end users, possibly more than a thousand, depending on different assumptions and what you're willing to do in terms of a trade off of devices. And you do not have to put devices on inside every or on every home. You can give people a puck type device that they will bring home. That turns the CBRS magic into Wi-Fi magic. And then um, you don't actually have to send someone into the home to install things. And that takes a lot of operating costs off the table. It really makes this kind of work better. So we're seeing a lot of these experiments. I mean, I think I'd read somewhere that we're seeing 10,000 CBRS networks being built right now. Some small fraction of those are being built by groups and sort of in the public interest or libraries. Um, our estimates is that, you know, for the system that we were looking at, you have a couple of different costs. One is to get fiber to the roof, which will, which will then power the system. And uh, for where we were looking, we thought we could do that for less than $10,000 um, because we had fiber very nearby. And so um, if you have to move fiber a significant amount, that itself could be $100,000, $200,000 or more. Um, but you want to get a high source of bandwidth to the roof. You need a 20 amp power circuit, which shouldn't be that expensive. And then you can put up on the order of $150,000, $200,000, if I remember correctly, worth of CBRS. That's like a five-year investment, basically, um, that that equipment would be expected to last. It gives you 360 degrees of 
of transmitting. And then devices that are on the order of two or $300 per. So if you get a thousand of those, $200,000. We kind of looked at this and thought for $500,000, $600,000, we could scrape by to do a kind of experiment with this. And that would deliver a service that would probably be on the order of better than Comcast Internet Essentials at the time, 25.3 or now 55. I think my goal would be more like 25 or 30.10 um, in terms of, of having a better, more um, upstream than you typically find and um, and uh, and a robust downstream as well. For people who aren't familiar with those numbers, just think of you're basically a connection that will support three to four people doing Zoom calls at the same time. Um, and the library could check those out, those pucks out effectively, or the school district could distribute them. Um, I think trying to collect you know, revenue from that is probably more trouble than it's worth. Um, but that's kind of where we are costing it out. This is something we're seeing a lot of in terms of community networks moving forward. And I thought it might be helpful just to cover kind of a little bit of the costs of why this approach is exciting. Um, there is limited bandwidth. And so in some urban areas, it will not perform as well as in other urban areas, uh, depending on how many other systems are competing for that bandwidth. Um, but this goal of trying to prevent having to send someone to the home to install equipment that then may have to be adjusted from time to time, um, that's kind of one of the reasons that people are adopting this CBRS technology. Um, I think it's very exciting. I desperately hope that in coming years, we see the FCC create more of this, um, perhaps even some that would be exclusively for use by libraries or they would have some kind of prioritized use. Um, but that's kind of a, an overview. And then anyway, I'd love to have a, a, a couple of uh, minutes for Q&A if anyone has any, and I, but I don't want to take any of Sarbani's time. That's great, Chris. Uh, it's, it's a good story. Uh, how, what's the population for that project you're trying to serve? Um, I think if you start getting beyond a thousand people using it, you're going to want to have more antenna sites because you're just, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on how much you can push through this, but I think, you know, as you get beyond a thousand people using it, there's going to, you're going to have so many people trying to use it simultaneously that you'll see significant degradation in performance. And so yeah. I would say, you know, my impression is on the order of, of, um, if you can have, aim to serve less than a thousand people in a circle of about a core of about a, a half mile radius, right. um, you know, in the right environment of not having too many tall buildings and things like that. Um, you know, you can get away with that on the order of, um, you know, of many hundreds of thousands of dollars, but less than a million dollars per. And that's over five years. I mean, you're okay. going to have to invest a little bit more to update hockey pucks. Some will get lost, um, you know, um, but um, but for the most part, your recurring costs are really going to be more about that. Um, the bandwidth, you know, which is going to be probably, um, you know, anywhere from if you're doing a gig to 10 gigs, which is probably what you want. You know, I'm going to guess you're in the um, hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars per month, depending on where you are. Right. Well, you're right. Uh, CBRS is, in fact, uh, uh, an exciting area of spectrum uh, policy and management and and uh, uh, and implementations. We've we've touched on this range. I mean, through the series, we've focused on various you know spectrum types: TV white space, EBS, CBRS, five gigahertz is you know very practical in certain circumstances. Uh, uh, question for you is, you know, how how do start this i mean how do you how do how do you analyze your environment i mean you just can't yeah. say let's go do a cbrs you want to find out what's what you've got and you know where to start it's just i wouldn't have possible. even gotten this far if not for the fact that we have a great isp in minneapolis a local a company that um, i've become close friends with over the years us internet for anyone who watches you know, we do a show called Connect This, where the, the owner of that um, is, a, he and I co-host talking about different topics. Uh, he's been on my podcast a bunch of times, so I talk about him all the time, but but he was just, he's already planning on trying to do this. And, and so trying to do this is very difficult if you don't have that. And so one of the first things to do is try to cultivate someone who's in this space, in part because you know, for his, he has a relationship with the vendors. If you're trying to like the, the supply chains being in disarray right now, trying to get all this stuff lined up, it can be hard. So if you can have a good relationship with someone, um, that's the way to get this started on a one-off. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's going to be quite difficult. You really need to find someone that is going to have some background um, in it, have relationships that you can build on. Um, and so I think that's, you know, it, 
I think a lot of cities, even rural areas, have somebody nearby who has this kind of expertise. They may be hard to find, um, but you know whether it's you, Don, or me, or other people like Dustin, um, I think a lot of us have some of these relationships that we can try to find the right people in different areas. Well, you're right. There are a lot of uh, wireless ISPs around the country, and they're uh, ingenious uh, folks and also very invested in their communities, which is a really uh, different from the from the major, uh, you know, uh, carriers who have allegiances elsewhere. And, and as we've the, said for a long time, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and, and one of the things we've seen, I mean, bu um, not Buffalo, um, the hot part of Colorado and Denver, um, Boulder, um, they have used their public facilities, um, schools and such in a partnership with a wireless company where that wireless company uses those spaces to um, set up as transmitters and then they offer free service for certain people as part of that deal. And I think that's an opportunity um, that's really worth pursuing in particularly more urban areas where it's difficult to figure out where you can put transmitters up. Yeah. If you can have a relationship where you're trying to sell to some folks and other folks get free service, that can be a win-win. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to go with this, and I appreciated your your uh, early comment about lessons. You know, so whatever you try to do, however it turns out, you probably are smarter than you were before, and that's valuable. That's valuable. Um, and and you make the case for anchors, uh, not just as network nodes, but as functional uh, players in a uh, working uh, community network. And and appreciate that point. So we'll see if we've got time at the end, but we do want to get to um, uh, Sorbani and uh, let me share again here. You can see, Chris, I have uh, demoted you. Thank and you for your so, time today. And, uh, <laughs> and I appreciate it. I'm going to um, tell everyone I'm the president today. <laughs> okay. First slide, we got you there. Okay, uh, Sarbani, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you, you're staying up kind of late in, in uh, India, and we're, we're excited to have you and hear your, your story. And so please uh, take it away. Let me stop the share here. And you are, you're up. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And um... I, I really feel uh, very happy to share uh, my work along with uh, all of y'all. I am based out of uh, Mumbai uh, at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. I'm the senior research scientist here. Sorry. And um, I am also the Asia Regional Coordinator for the Association for Progressive Communications um, based out of Mumbai have been working in the area of um, connecting the unconnected by seeding community networks to grow in uh, remote rural villages of India uh, for, uh, for a long time now, for the past five to six years. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of local libraries and community networks. So we all know about libraries as something that is there in the urban areas. And uh, these are, um, these are uh, sort of the repository of knowledge. Um, so we, um, so this, this is nothing much to say. It's like a collection of information and repository of knowledge. It is also an in interconnected platform where uh, these libraries are like, we have quite a lot of uh, library networks in India and uh, which is like, um, which is each of the universities in India are connected to each other through the libraries. And um, similar way, the state governments also have library networks. So each of these libraries are again connected. So, uh, and it also makes uh, information very easily accessible by all. And um, now with the advent of connectivity um, uh, being very, uh, uh, predominant. Uh, so it is like digital libraries and um, open versus subscription model, like some of the information that you can get uh, from the Indian Institute of Technology library, you will not get it somewhere else until and unless you have a subscription model. 
Now, uh, connected library networks are, uh, they work in two different ways that there is a central library and there are libraries connected to each other. And then the second picture on the, on the right hand side shows that each of the libraries also speak to each other and there is a central library connection. Now, um, I, I just want to tell a little bit about uh, the Government of India BharatNet initiative. Uh, this is an initiative uh, taken by the Government of India to, to lay optical fiber network to all the village council offices. Um, all the village councils, that is 250,000 uh, village councils in India and uh, called the Gram Panchayats. So now in that library is also included as one of the locations within the village where, um, where the connectivity can be taken to. So they have identified the government office, the post office, Anganwadi or the, or the creche, uh, primary healthcare center and schools as the other other locations where the connectivity will uh, will be enabled and it has been there for quite a number of village councils where the connectivity has already reached um, so so that's there but the relevance of libraries in rural areas is not so um, is not we can't we don't see it yet in the rural areas and the reason is that the rural uh, communities, in the rural communities, um, the illiteracy and semi-literacy rates are very high in India. So, the so that's the reason why a library as a structure doesn't exist so much in the rural areas in comparison to the urban areas. Now, uh, what are the role of community networks? Um, so we all speak about community networks. Just think about community networks as networks by the people for the people. It's uh, nothing that is that we, um, so it is all based on the community needs. So we are not even talking about our needs of connecting the unconnected, but it is the community's needs to connect themselves and why they want to connect themselves, what they want to do out of that connectivity, it is entirely left to the community. We don't, we don't enforce anything on them. And of course, when it is based on community needs, um, it is owned by the community. So sometimes, uh, sometimes the initial capex expenditure is uh, done through some project funding or the other. But most of the times, what happens is that communities identify infrastructure that is already available or resources that are that are already available in their locations. Like for example, if there is a need of a tower, um, they might want to set up a tower with the bamboo bamboo if that is there so it is in one of the community networks in brazil um, they have set up they have built a tower of bamboo because bamboo is so readily available there uh, then uh, these community networks doesn't only bridges the digital divide but also they bridge these networks bridge the social divides. In India, we have the other social divides of gender, caste, and class. So, you know, in this, in the community networks, everyone has an equal say. Everyone becomes, uh, becomes uh, a member of that connectivity journey. So, uh, and everything sustainability model is also looked at through partnerships and entrepreneurship models. I'll tell you, tell it uh, a little later in the presentation. And in community networks, everything is local. We don't want anything to come from outside. It is everything local. So capacity building is also local. The devices, uh, we just get the devices from outside, but most of the things are local. Now, in an ideal scenario, the connectivity usage in community networks are often seen like this, that you have a device. Uh, most of the times, it is a solar panel because uh, enabled the, as their energy source. And uh, we have these devices uh, within the community, and uh, people use it. So, so people use the devices, uh, people use the connectivity mostly uh, uh, connecting to the wireless wireless uh, to the to the local access server so they are not exactly connecting 
with each other, but mostly as a repository, a local access server that is placed in the community becomes a local library for them. Um, and, um, and this is what is an ideal scenario, but there are it, this is not the only scenario. There are other scenarios uh, which you can see in different community networks. Now, what is this role of local libraries? Now, why are we talking about local libraries and not talking about libraries as such what we find in the urban areas? Because these local libraries caters to the community needs. And in most of the cases where community networks are uh, dealing with or they enable connectivity to the indigenous, uh, indigenous population, indigenous tribal population. And in these indigenous tribal population, they have a lot of local knowledge of their own. Like for example, in some of these communities, language is uh, language is sort of eroding. They don't uh, they don't know whether the language will remain the writing script or uh, the the way they speak. Uh, it might not be there existent in the next uh, generation. Or, for example, a particular type of music or a cultural practice that they follow might not be relevant for the next generation. So they want these knowledge, local in, and indigenous knowledge, to be collected in that local access server, which is the local library in the community. And uh, what, what happens is that these local library, uh, this local uh, access, uh, uh, local access servers uh, are housed in a location which becomes the center for capacity building and training of the local youth. And, um, and in a way, uh, what happens is that uh, people then try to understand within the community, they explore options by which they can, um, they can enable certain types of entrepreneurship options uh, for, uh, for economic empowerment. And this type of libraries, the local libraries, suits the needs of illiterate and semi-literate population because they don't know how to read and write. So they don't connect themselves with the other libraries where we have such, num such a number of digital books and other information. And everything stays within the community and everything is local. Now, uh, how is local knowledge creation in community networks? Like we have discussed about, now I just discussed about local knowledge. Now, how it is created? Now, we identify what are the different types of local knowledge. Like this is an example of the local knowledge in the in the location community network that, that I seeded to grow in the year 2019, uh, funded by uh, Association for Progressive Communications in a location that is in remote Maharashtra, uh, five hours drive from Mumbai. Now we have a community support center um, that is the location where the local access server is placed. And I was telling you about that. This is the location where the capacity building of the youth takes place. And now we have access points. This is uh, only connectivity is enabled through a SIM card based cellular router at the community support center. And the rest of the network is an offline mesh network. And what happens is most of the uh, youth what they do is, or people in the community, if they, ident if they know some art forms of theirs, like for example, painting or music or things of that sort, they come to the access point that is placed in the ham in the, uh, on top of the house um, uh, that serves as a uh, Wi-Fi hotspot also. They come and they, um, they upload the content onto the local access server. And the local access server is connected to the uh, cellular router, and that's the only avenue for the local access server to be connected to the online online space, which by which we can look into the content that is being created in the local access server. So this is this makes it possible for the people in the village to not only see each other's uh, content or whatever knowledge, but also within themselves as well. We also do a lot of infrastructure reuse and sharing. That's what I had mentioned earlier. And uh, some type of indigenous technology development, like we use routers like Libre Router, Libre Mesh, community radio, and uh, community platform and e-commerce website for the community. Now, this is one form of local uh, library 
that we have set up in our community network is a knowledge sharing platform. And if you look at it, this is what is the gist of the talk that I gave just now, is that this these tribal people being indigenous tribes, they have a lot of knowledge on agrobiodiversity. Now, and they also have a lot of knowledge on art and culture of this, and none of this is in any written form. So it is just by word of mouth just that passes on from generation to generation. And what we have enabled is that an offline mobile application by which this information is collected from the agrobiodiversity information is collected from the farmers and from the common people in the community, art and culture information is, uh, is, um, um, is shared. So they, they get this information, they put it up in the local access server, and that's where, that's their local library. And this is this is um, and this information out of that art and culture, some of the paintings and paper mesh art has been converted into products. And if you look at it, these are some of the products which we sell online as in the e-commerce platform that becomes uh, opportunity gives them uh, gives them the opportunity to earn money out of the connectivity. So uh, that's from me. Yes, thanks. That's wonderful. Uh, you, your final point there about a, a market for these uh, cultural uh, uh, crafts, uh, you know, that, that these villages you point out are, are, in, are unique in a lot of ways, the way they've evolved historically and their dialects and all that and their art also. And I, I, there must be a, a lot of interest in these kinds of things around the world and the internet allows you to find. So did I understand that the principal backhaul for the for these community networks is the cell network? Uh, yes. So here, because this is a location uh, where which is located within the uh, amongst uh, covered by three uh, covered by hills on three sides. And this is this location is in the valley. So connectivity is very difficult to get. So what we, that community support center, which I uh, sh uh, showed is the location where the mobile signal strength is the strongest. And we put up a tower on top of the house on the community support center. And a SIM card based cellular router has been put up on top of it. So it catches the uh, mobile signals and the Wi-Fi through the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi signals are uh, detected on the smartphone below the, um, below the community support center. Yes, over there. And that's how the connectivity is at only that location, enabling banking facilities. You'll see this woman on the left-hand side in the orange dress. She is the, digit, she is the banking correspondent and she accesses that Wi-Fi signals on a smartphone and with a biometric device enables banking facilities facilities to the villagers in the village. Yes. Outstanding. Uh, you you open with the uh, approach of uh, community networks uh, by and for the communities. It still seems like it would be a, a major challenge in a lot of villages to actually build such a thing that you just described. So certainly someone from somewhere outside of the village has to come in and help. Yes, we often work together with the uh, organizations that are already working within the village. So we can't go into the village and uh, tell them that, oh, come, let's, let's set up a community network. So they don't accept us within the village. So we, this, is, this community network, which was seeded to grow in 2019, has been an effort two and a half years before that we had started the journey with the community. So uh, we work with organizations that are working within the community and we, uh, we work together with them to, uh, to get the community buy-in for, uh, uh, for deploying network of their own, yes. Great, so um, there's always the question of uh, sustainability, right? Yes. The, the, the business model to keep, you know, pay upfront and then ongoing costs. Uh, I'm sure this cell connection is not cheap if a lot of people are demanding a lot of data through it. Uh, so how does that uh, how does that work? How do people how does it sustain itself? Yes. Um, 
so uh, so we don't provide because i i am from the academic institution uh, so we we cannot um, provide any services and earn money out of uh, the uh, connectivity so the sim card based cellular router has two sim card uh, that can be inserted into it and the two sim cards are of this banking correspondent lady whom you see in this photograph uh, on the left hand side and she and she does the mobile recharge a normal mobile recharge you don't even have to do um, expensive uh, bandwidth uh, backhaul nothing like that it's just the uh, the data that you get on your mobile phone is what she uses and utilizes to earn money uh, by enabling these banking services within the village so so she earns money uh, by enabling the banking services in the village and uh, so she charges a commission for every transaction and uh, the villagers instead uh, how do they earn money is most on the offline network they they um, they share their local knowledge like i showed these art forms these art and culture forms uh, so these are the things that they share uh, on the offline mesh network on the local access server the in, the information is stored there and we identified products how to make certain products like paintings paper mesh and all paper mesh masks and all and those are being sold online in an e-commerce platform so these you see that painting there and the paper mesh uh, thing these are being sold online so it is so the money goes directly to the people in the village community we don't we are no middlemen in, in involved in it we only identify the products that needs to be put up online in the e-commerce platform yes and so the so there's no sharing of the revenue to support the networks no. okay no. all right all right yes well this is this is really impressive uh the it, it embodies a kind of an approach that we've been advocating for a long time around community networking is a a, a combination of build out and build in yes. so we assert that it's the responsibility of government to build out towards communities, not connect to everybody, it's, it's too much to ask, but to, to connect a point of presence, uh, an anchor, a public anchor institution off of which these networks can be built. And then the responsibility uh, and, and urge this idea that you embody and that Chris talks about of, of, of self-reliance and self-responsibility to take ownership of your, of your local network uh i mean you can do it however you want to and however you can you want to sell your community to, you know a company it's yours you know but otherwise uh to uh then uh you know uh, connect at that at that uh, interchange point um your one of your slides showed an interesting uh, image of a charging station a phone charging station is that is that connected to the network there the phone charger or is it just a yes yes so that's uh, the phone charger that uh, has been enabled on the solar um, uh, solar battery backup with a 72 hour solar battery backup that is there and that's a phone charger so people can charge their phones on it and um, yeah so and this uh, location being very um, there's a lot of sunlight there and uh, it's only it rains only very heavily only for the three months of um, uh, july august and september so but the rest of the time it's perfect and it is uh, working perfectly well um, what does that cost uh, so the solar uh, the solar ones uh, the solar panels that we have set up are uh, small solar panels uh, which is uh, which uh, which uh, has not a we, we don't use a lot of um, uh, space for the battery backup and um, it is it is not very expensive we went in for a very cheap model of uh, solar panels uh, made uh, proprietary uh, pro it's it's a proprietary uh, thing from a company here in india called m2m cybernetics um, that has provided us the solar panels so that capex infrastructure that we have invested is from the uh, apc grant 
So APC has funded us for that project in 2019, where we set up the solar panels and the tower that we have put up on the community support center. Here, the tower is not uh, there, but uh, something like this on the community support center, we have a tower and uh, the access points. So that's the thing that we have got as uh, grants from APC. And the rest of it is the capacity building is from the people in the village. They deployed the network. We did the training and, um, and they are using it in their own ways. Like they identified community radio as a technology development that they wanted to use. And uh, so that is developed on a Raspberry Pi device. Yes. That's great. Uh, mm. this, this kind of initiative is really critical, I think. Uh, because there's so many people that are in similar situations as this village around the world, you know, three and a half billion people are yet to have this kind of capability. And there are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, uh, next week, we're going to be talking about offline internet. Yes. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that you can do digital services without, you know, the open internet. And uh, so this is, this is highly uh, interesting and uh, you sh you're to be complimented, you and APC for all the great work you guys have done. Um, it, let me, I'm looking for any questions for design is appreciated, the, the backup power, the SIM card, all, of every, all the components there. Uh, the capacity building is I think, as you pointed out, is, is really critical to the success of this because you have, you know, we, we would think of these things in sort of developed countries as we have a, you know, standardized literacy platform to yes. build services on, but it's not applicable everywhere. And you're translating that into whatever the, the medium of communication is in, in the location, right? Yes, yes. So we, uh, we completely completely go with the community and what the community wants to do with the connectivity. And um, when we initially began with this project, um, so two and a half years before 2019, so 2017, when we exactly started discussing, they made it very clear that they don't want a 24 into seven connectivity at all because they know that they cannot pay for such a connectivity. So they told that just enable us the banking services with that connectivity and the rest of it is can be an offline mesh network and we can do things on that offline thing. So we have a talkie application that's an open source application, which is like the offline WhatsApp system. So they can talk to each other, they can share, they can chat with each other, they can share files with each other on that talkie application, yes. Great, I, and you, you make the point that there's so much uh, valuable information which is not high bandwidth. Uh, yes. You know, there, our, our favorite example of the difference between data and information is in kind of like a really uh, urgent situation. There's some crisis, you've lost contact with your family and the value of the information in a text message, you know, mom, we're okay. Versus mm -hmm. the amount of data in that message is just illustrative of, of, you know, the difference between data and information. So there's a lot can be done very low, uh, bandwidths. Uh, you know, people get feverish about, you know, gigabit connectivity, but the things that we're, we really need to have communication are not high bandwidth, you know, email and text messages and these kind in these small transactions uh, are, yes. are great for this kind of a technology as it evolves. And of course, people always want more once they have, you know, get it going. So um, thank you again, Sarbani, for showing up. Uh, we you. are over a little bit on our time here. Um, but uh well, we are over a little bit on our time, so I think we will uh, close our recorded session uh, now. Stephen, thank you.